There are nights when you look up and the sky doesn't feel like a ceiling at all, but a question, not a loud one, more like a quiet pressure behind the eyes. What is all of this? What holds the stars apart and what holds their light together? We live inside a universe that doesn't explain itself, and yet we've learned that mystery isn't a wall, it's an invitation. The story of space science is the story of humans refusing to accept the night as unknowable, but also refusing to pretend we know more than we do. You don't try and go into space and up to the moon and Mars and build space stations and so on so you can escape the Earth when you've messed it up. It is the opposite. The idea is that by going into space, building infrastructure, ultimately exist, uh, accessing resources in space, you save the Earth. The one minute uh, answer is we don't know. So one of our theories is that space and time for that matter. So I, I should say back in 1905, Einstein realized that space and time are not separate, but they're woven together into something that's often called the fabric of the universe or more technically space time. Space time emerges from something deeper, which is just basically quantum entanglement. So we think that there is a description of our universe, which is just uh, bits of information basically, or qubits to be more technical quantum bits of information that are entangled together into some sort of network so space and time don't exist in that network and then space and time emerge from that deeper theory. It's also a thing that, you know, it's the distance between stuff that you throw. <laughs> but, but whatever. <laughs> right. When Brian Cox talks about space, he starts where real physics starts, with humility. We describe space as distance, the gap between objects, the place where things happen but modern theories keep suggesting something more unsettling, that space and time might not be fundamental at all. They may emerge from a deeper layer of reality built out of information and quantum entanglement. If that's true, then the emptiness we stare into isn't empty. It's the visible shadow of invisible structure. Space may be less like a stage and more like a pattern. Relationships first, geometry second. You don't have to accept that picture as final to feel its weight. Even the possibility changes how you think about everything else. We don't have any evidence that alien life is the answer. So in the past, so we've landed missions on Mars, for example, the Viking missions in the 1970s, um, there was some suggestion that there might be some chemical reactions that looked a bit like life, and then it turned out that it probably wasn't because it's very difficult to distinguish geology and chemistry from biology when you don't know what the kind of biology is that you're looking for. If I was to guess, I would say humans, and that's not supposed to be a joke. I think that the biggest threat to our civilization is us. So we have complete control over that, but it might not help us, um, which says something about our uh, stupidity. A comet came in from the outer solar system, as they do, and it, and it happened to be aligned with Earth, it happened to hit Earth, then there's nothing we could do about it at the moment. Uh, most of the asteroids, the big asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit, we've mapped, but there are a few maybe that we haven't, we're, we're looking, so we're actively trying to do that. Once you accept how strange the foundations might be, the famous questions stop being trivia. Are we alone? We don't have evidence for life beyond Earth, none that holds up under careful inspection. Mars has offered hints and false starts. The Viking experiments in the 1970s taught us how hard it is to tell biology from chemistry when you don't know what kind of life you're looking for. And yet the search continues because the universe is vast and because life is not a trivial thing once it appears. The honest position isn't cynicism or belief, it's patient curiosity on a scale our ancestors couldn't attempt. So it's not, we're not far off being able to travel, build moon bases and then travel to Mars. Uh, we're, we're quite a long way off going from Mars beyond, the, actually beyond the solar system maybe, we're a long way off doing that. But at some point, if we do that, then nothing's gonna wipe us out. Kind of obvious to say it's possible into the future, because of course that's what we're doing, we're moving into the future. It then gets interesting, because you say, well, why do we have to go into the future? Why can't I stop going into the future? Well, you can vary the rate at which you go into the future relative to someone else. For example, if I was to get in a rocket now and accelerate off, even at 1G, right, just a sort of acceleration I could take and, and head off and end up traveling relatively close to the speed of light 
and let's say go to the Andromeda galaxy and then which is two million light years away from from the perspective of the Earth and then turn around and come back again. If I go close enough to speed of light I could arrange it so I would age let's say a year on the outward journey and a year on the inward journey and you could do that calculation. But four million years would have passed on Earth. Uh, his general theory of relativity where space and time can be curved, that's his theory of gravity, the correct thing to say is that we can imagine uh, distortion, geometries is the best way to say it. We can imagine geometries of, of space and time. Uh, wormholes would be an example where if you could go through them, you could travel into the past. Then there's time, which feels so intimate that we mistake it for simple. We move through it like a participant in a story, but Einstein showed it's part of the fabric of space-time, not a separate river. The startling consequence is that time travel to the future is already real. Travel fast enough and you return younger than the people you left behind. Not because clocks break, but because time itself is shaped by motion and gravity. Going to the past is different. General relativity allows exotic geometries, wormholes, loops in time, but physics doesn't yet tell us whether nature permits building them. Hawking's idea of chronology protection is a warning that the universe may keep its own history consistent. The boundary between what's allowed in equations and what's allowed in reality is still a frontier. I would say that I would hit them over the head with Newton's Principia. Because the implication, can you imagine if every time you get on a plane and fly somewhere, then the person who's in charge of the plane is part of a vast conspiracy that's trying to deceive you. Just imagine that. But how nervous would you be on the plane if the people that are flying it are, are actually just keeping you in the dark about the real nature of reality? How does that make you feel? You never get on a plane again. That would be great because then when I go on holiday, I never bump into a flat earther because they don't tramp. It's the size of the universe. The bit we can see which is what's called the observable universe, has about between one and two trillion galaxies in it, depending on how you, uh, you know, little tiny galaxies and big galaxies, but it's some, let's say a trillion-ish, something like that. So my favorite fact about the universe is that it might be infinitely big. So a supermassive black hole in M87. It's 55 million light years away, that one. And if you fell towards that one, then, as far as we know, you would fall across the horizon into the interior of the black hole uh, and you'd be unaffected. You wouldn't notice as you fell across the horizon. And then you'd have something like, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like 30 hours-ish inside the black hole until you approach the singularity, which is in your future when you cross the horizon. So, so it's not something you can avoid. It, it's like trying to avoid tomorrow. You can't do that. So you go to this singularity, which is in Einstein's theory, the end of time. And just before you get there, you get spaghettified, which means you get stretched in one direction and squashed in the other. And even your atoms get ripped apart. And then you go to the end of time. So that's not nice. However, if you put quantum mechanics in, which goes back to Stephen Hawking's work in the 1970s, then we can start debating about what the horizon is and there are certain ideas that you might get when viewed from the outside you might look to get it might appear you get incinerated before you cross the horizon and all your ashes come back out into space again but from your perspective it seems that you wouldn't get incinerated from your perspective you'd go inside and then you get spaghettified and then the question is do you get vaporized or spaghettified and the answer might be both which is called black hole complementarity which is all very complicated scale is another quiet shock the observable universe contains on the order of a trillion galaxies, and that visible patch may be only a small region of whatever exists. Whether the cosmos goes on forever, we don't know, but even might be infinite is enough to humble a species living on one world. That humility can feel like an existential crisis until you notice the other side of it. If the universe is this large, then conscious life is not small because it is trivial. It's small because it is rare and precious, perhaps a way the universe becomes aware of itself, however briefly. If you enjoy these deep dives, consider subscribing, and please share your thoughts in the comments. What answer from Cox feels most unsettling, or most hopeful? Because the final feeling this episode leaves isn't despair, it's responsibility mixed with wonder. We are small in space and time, yes, but we are also the kind of small thing that can ask magnificent questions, 
build instruments to answer them and choose what to do with the knowledge. And just beyond the edge of today's answers waits another mystery. What truly began the cosmos? And whether before the Big Bang is even a meaningful phrase? That question, still open, is where we'll go next.